So thank you, everybody. So um, this is another session on this exciting schedule. So this is Progress on Trial, Reinvigorating Faith and Growth Amid Modern Challenges. And the idea for this session was really looking at the existential and institutional barriers to belief in progress. So what kinds of challenges to the idea of progress are we seeing today, for example? Do we need different benchmarks for success, whether that's measuring happiness rather than GDP? But also other discussions about the institutions and within the civil service, are there particular barriers or vested interests that we need to examine to make sure that we can navigate better the different challenges to growth and progress in our society today. So we're looking at a whole range of things. We've got a very broad panel looking at the environment, looking at housing, looking at tax and regulation and other different issues that um, are being challenged under the question of progress and economic growth today. So I'm very excited to introduce a, a very distinguished panel. So we have uh, Aria Babu, who has been co-convening at uh, this uh, conference. She is a policy fellow at Policy Exchange and also Kodak. And she's also the former head of policy at the Entrepreneurs Network. And she's often associated with uh, uh, discussing things like childcare and pronatalism and transhumanist feminism, um, as she describes it. <laughs> and we also have Nicholas Boy Smith, who is uh, the founding director of Create Streets, a, a charity and an influential writer when it comes to design and, and the history of towns and cities. And he was also a co chair alongside Sir, the late Roger Scruton on the influential. Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, which was described as seminal by the then Secretary of State for Housing. We also have uh, Matt Ridley, which uh, many of you will know, who has written many books on these subjects, which has sold over a million copies and translated into 31 languages. Some of those books uh, include The Rational Optimist, uh, How Innovation Works, and most recently, The Search for the Origin of COVID-19, co-authored with Alina Chan, which was published in 2021. Uh, and, and sadly, uh, Dan Senor, who was uh, meant to be joining us for this panel, can, can no longer join us. But I'm very thankful uh, that Sorry, Sam... Mate. <laughs> Sam Richards has stepped in last minute and he is the CEO of Britain Remade and also a former special advisor number 10 particularly focused on energy and the uh, environment. So we're going to first kick off this session uh, with Nicholas Boy Smith who also has a presentation. Thank you very much. Good staff work. You've changed, you've changed the images. Well done. Yeah. Um, this feels a very traditional um, conference because I think the key theme so far has been jokes about French. Um, uh, starting with my Lord Sainsbury's, at least we're ahead of the French, and uh, ending up with sh a steal from the French. Ladies and gentlemen, my wife is French. I'm not sure how I feel about this. Um, so, um, right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is London's first bypass. Uh, it was known as the New Road, and it ran for a bit over three miles from the junction of Harrow and Edgware Roads uh, to Battle Bridge, which we now call King's Cross, up what's now Pentonville Road, uh, before joining the Angel Inn at Islington, uh, from which the existing uh, St John Street could enter the city at Smithfield. Um, it was primarily built, not for humans actually, but for, for the twice weekly flood of animals uh, approaching London from the west. Uh, 150,000 turkeys, 74,000 cattle, 570,000 sheep made their way to Smithfield each year in the mid-18th century for their terminal rendezvous with the butcher's knife. It was called droving. Uh, and this is infrastructure, Georgian style. Droving animals was the single most important transport requirement uh, in 18th century. No fridges. No trains, no lorries. If the cattle could not walk to London uh, on their own hooves, London could not eat. Uh, I think to pick up a theme, this just occurred to me, the French call us les roast beef, don't they? So the roast beef literally walked, uh, walked, to, uh, to, walked to London. All the fields and the farms on the routes uh, made their money by um, allowing the cattle to, uh, to, 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 to pasture, and every drover's arms you've ever visited is on an old droving route. So it was really the, a, a bypass of its day, the latest technology, a very important upgrade, not the latest technology, but a very important upgrade of existing infrastructure. And here is the thing. It was first promoted to Parliament, Anton uh, was, was touching on this, in February, February 1756, the month matters. In May 1756, an act was passed. In the same month, commissioners were appointed, and a surveyor, a Mr Marsh, I've got his name, was paid five guineas to plan the road. It was built that summer. Uh, by the 13th of September, uh, carts were passing along one stretch of the road, and in phase two, by the 17th of September, uh, carts and critically animals, those droving animals, were passing along its entire length. Seven months from parliamentary start to parliament to physical finish, from lobbying to legislation, from droving to slaughter. Seven months. Now, you may be thinking, I'm sure some of you are thinking, oh, in fact, this was touched on in the first, in the first session. It's much easier then. Less, less to do, no democracy, no judicial reviews, none of these people getting in the way. Well, sort of. Um, so, 
it is true that construction was simpler. It was mainly removing hedges and banks, levelling the surface, digging ditches. Uh, the road wasn't paved so that it could be used by the drovers. So there was less to do than in a modern bypass. But in many ways, it was much, much harder. Uh, it needed uh, primary legislation, which you wouldn't need now to build an individual road. Um, it, there were no power tools, there were no cranes, there was no diesel, no electricity, no heavy lifters. Just the brute force of hard-working navvies, hard-drinking, hard-working. Uh, above all, there were very clearly established local property rights. Uh, the route was changed because some local landowners objected to it. And the Establishing Act required the con compensation to be paid um, and also only allowed um, houses to be set back 40 feet from the road. You can see it here after it, uh, it was built out. So our first, our, first, uh, our, first high, our first bypass. Now let's jump forward. I'm not going to say in the 18th century, you're pleased to know. Let's jump forward 263 years. This is one of Britain's most recent bypasses, the four mile, a little bit longer, Newtown Bypass in central Wales. I'm sure you all know it well. Um, it was opened in February 2019. How long do you think it has been in planning, ladies and gentlemen? Six months. <laughs> any other? Any other? Down the back. I've got one minute. No, I'm going to be more than a minute. Um, ten, ten years. Ten years. Ten years. Any up? Any up on ten years? Seventeen years. Thirty years. Nope. Forty. Seventy. <laughs> Seventy years. It was. Hang on. There we go. So uh, this is a letter. Uh, uh, in the, in the, um, in, oh, I don't know what it was in actually, uh, uh, asking to recruit young 16 year old boys to start counting the cars so they could work out uh, where and how to build the bypass. So there was an attempt in the 1940s, actually, we were quite good at building these in the 1940s. There was an attempt in the 1960s and the 1980s. It was finally confirmed in 2008. Do you know what happened next? The plans were shelved in 2011. Uh, they then finally got going again, and construction started in early 2016, and was it completed in 2019. And it's not just infrastructure. It's also, in fact, it's even more, it's, uh, it's housing. Here's a table from the brilliant 2018 Oliver Letwin report into house building build-out rates. Uh, I won't go through every one, but this is basically how long it takes to build out big sites for a range of sites. Eight the best, 43 years is the worst. And before that can even start, on average, it takes somewhere between seven and 10 years in, in getting land allocated, pre-planning, outline planning, environmental impact assessments, heritage assessments, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for that because the social enterprise I run, Create Streets, gets good money for doing some of those things. And indeed, I'm, I'm feeding my children uh, with that. So, you know, I'm, 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 it's great. It's a boondoggle for consultants. Um, we, why do we do this to ourselves? And it's just, um, uh, this is, so I should have said this. This is, so this is, um, uh, this is you know, uh, the creation of homes uh, in the 19th century. We doubled the housing stock from three, just under four to 10, 99 million homes. House prices fell for 70 years in the run-up to World War I. So we, we talk about the great success of house building after World War II, and we did build houses after World War II for a bit. The real success, actually, uh, the complete explosion of affordability of housing um, happened in the 19th century. Um, and this isn't, by the way, um, a lack of regulation. Um, so this was done, this is actually 18th century legislation, regulation, there was more in the 19th century. There were very clear rules about what you could and couldn't build, which is why those houses on the right there seem so familiar, because those are visual representations of the 1667, 1707 and 1774 Housing Act. So we've always regulated what we build. So what's going on? Um, what's the smoking gun? It's, it's, it's a little bit too simple to say, um, <laughs> I've got zero minutes. OK, you're going to have to have zero, you're going to have to, actually, I think there are really two smoking guns, because I want to bring in the French again. So I, I don't have a nice uh, slide, though, with, with, with two smoking guns. So I'd say two things. First of all, we need to relearn how to create places, housing, and infrastructure that people love. And secondly, we need, I'm changing the wording on this, we need to stop being so worried about the French um, in terms of our approach to planning. Actually, there's a serious point there. Um, so first quick thing, this is Regent Street, as built by John Nash. Lovely, beautiful. Um, slightly, under, the, 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 um, the portico under the arcade was, a, was one of the top spaces for high-class London courtesans, which is a posh word for something else. Um, it was all pulled down just over 100 years later, and this was put up. Uh, designed by uh, Reginald Broomfield, Aston Webb, Ernest Newton. It went from four storeys to six to seven. There were a few complaints about knocking it down, but very few. No one really minded. 100 years ago. Um, this is the first Euston station. It was built, I've got the date here, it was built in 1837. Um, and then almost immediately afterwards, they built Euston Arch, which you can see on the right there. It was actually Doric Propyleum. Uh, Louisa Twining, who, who visited it a few days later, said nothing could be more beautiful. And a few years later, they then opened the second Euston station, replacing the first one, which you can see behind you there, uh, which, for my money, was one of the best uh, built uh, rooms in, uh, in London. Um, so they built two stations, one and then a second, in less time than... I'm not, I don't have pictures of what they're now doing. In less time than it's taken to be arguing about what we now do with Euston Station. When, as some of you will know, when Euston Arch was pulled down in the 1960s, there was a huge fight about it, and it led to, uh, to massive public resistance. These are the plans to knock down all of Whitehall, 
um, they were going to put up a series of ziggurats and, uh, and take out all of uh, the Foreign Office, uh, Westminster, most of, most of 10 Downing Street. Uh, only, the, only the banqueting uh, hall was, was going to survive. So Leslie Martin's plans. And the point is that this led to essentially near riots. Uh, the, the conservative GLC collapse was replaced by Labour. A uh, man who was there, uh, uh, Sam Jenkins, who's still with us, he said that officials uh, were, were lucky to get out alive. Um, uh, there were plans at the same time for a motorway box in central London. Uh, there were a few buildings. Um, the idea was that people would move around at first floor level, and a few buildings, uh, New Zealand House, uh, the Economist building in, in, uh, in St James' Street, still, still have the remnants of that. This is uh, Fitzroy Square, as it is today, thank heavens. This is what it was going to be. Um, as in the Traffic in Towns Colin Buchanan report. So there's a serious point here. The serious point is that we started, as a society, losing confidence that new development would make places better. And we started resisting it consistently. Now, we can go into in more detail. I'm, I'm definitely out of time as to, as to why that was. Um, second, point, so second point quickly. I'm being waved at, so I do need to stop. Um, second point very quickly. Um, so we didn't used to be afraid of aspiring to create beautiful places. It's literally what we did. It's in the preamble to 1930s planning regulation. Octavia Hill, one of the great social reformers of the 19th century, set out to create beautiful social housing. It was the word, it was the word she used. Um, and then just quickly a word on the French. Um, we had lots of regulation, literally, I mean, there's, there's always been regulation about what we build. This courtyard housing, 19th century, early 19th century courtyard housing, basically built in the gardens of 18th century houses, was banned during the course of the 19th century, a series of acts, public health acts, essentially created Coronation Street-style housing, which you had to build. So we set very clearly what you could build. But as long as you follow the regulation, off you go. We didn't regulate the process as we now do. We regulated the end result. And we've been running over the last 70 years a controlled experiment in the way we approach planning. Because all countries regulate the built environment. Um, we don't have a problem with more empty homes. We don't have a problem with a lower proportion of socially rented. We, this is actually old data on credit rates. All this, that's nonsense about credit rates. What we have is fewer homes per household. And the reason for that, and this is about regulatory clarity, is that we need to get win. It's an interesting phrase we use. We need to win planning permission. In most countries, you just need to get your building permission by following the local regulations. A friend of mine, who also married a French girl, I think about it, um, works running a large part of a housing association near Paris. His team can do a feasibility report on a site in a couple of hours. I pay very good money to do that. We can, get, we can get a couple of months' work out of that and many, many thousands of pounds. So it isn't that you don't regulate the built environment. I'm now being waved at. They really want me to stop. It's that you, it's that you allow, you prevent barriers to entry by making clear what you can or can't, or can't build. And this is a, I mean, I'll just jump over this. So these, this, is from a, this is from an online um, uh, service in Sweden. These are houses you can just literally order out of the post because in much of Sweden you can just build them. Um, we therefore have far lower uh, proportions of self-build, custom-build, SMEs, and market entrants reliant just on the big guys. So there we go. Let's not work with, and we worry about the French because we think if we have too much planning, we're being regulatory. But actually, we just need to have clearer planning, and that is how we fall back in love with the future. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for your opening remarks, Nicholas. Lots of things to chew on in the chair discussion. So over to you, Aria. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about childcare. Um, not because I think it's the most important barrier to progress. I think Nicholas might be right that it's probably something more about infrastructure building. But I think it's plausibly top 10, maybe even top 5. And I think it's very illustrative of how we get things wrong. Um, so the UK has uh, the most expensive childcare in the OECD, probably the world, unless Monaco is beating us. Um, we don't have the highest wages. We don't have the highest birth rate. We don't have the lowest levels of subsidy. In fact, we used to have the highest level of subsidy as well, and uh, we still had very high childcare costs. Um, currently, the average full-time childcare slot costs the same as 50% of the average mother's med like median mother's earnings. Um, I, if that is not a very well evenly distributed number either. So like because our, we subsidise like some people and it's like quite inconsistent. And if you happen to um, be married to someone who earns about ninety thousand pounds, you get all of your subsidy tapered away and stuff. But I do like anecdotally know people who are thinking right now if they have children, they have to make a big bet on how much they think that they as a woman are going to earn over the long term and whether or not it's worth just earning to pay for it just working to pay for childcare or if it's worth just staying at home because they end up about as wealthy no matter what they do. This is obviously a real problem as touched upon by one of the commenters in the session below. So why is our childcare so expensive? 
Um, basically, I think this is caused by a supply issue. Um, since the 1990s, the number of registered childminders has gone down by 80%. Um, we have not, we have like a decreased birth rate, but our birth rate has not decreased by that much since the 1990s. Sixteen percent of nurseries are now turning away parents because they're, they're full. Um, and how, so why do we get this position? Why does no one want to be a childminder anymore? So I think the first answer that people in politics usually go for is that we've got very strict ratios. We've got stricter ratios than basically anywhere else in the world that I could find. Uh, they're stricter than France, they're stricter than Norway, they're even stricter than Scotland. Um, uh, so it's one to three ratio, um, one adult to three babies, um, um, yeah, three children for babies, and then it goes slightly higher for two, and it goes slightly higher for three plus. Um, but it's still the case that if you have a child in school and you drop them off at a nursery after school, the ratio is stricter at the nursery than it is in the school where you have a teacher and a teaching assistant. Um, but I, don't, I think this is only part of the answer um, because, well, because we have another big problem as well, which is that we have an incredibly restrictive curriculum. The goal is that you have to teach children quite a lot before the age of four. Um, you don't, obviously, if you have to keep, keep your kid at home, you don't have to teach them motor skills or personal regulation or um, to make sure that they have British values or understand like healthy food. But if you have a child in nursery or childminding services, then you do. Um, most of us, I suspect, when we were kids, were dropped off with people um, who were like known to our families and just like gave you normal childcare. They were probably nice people. Um, I personally was dropped off with a next door neighbor who was retired and had some free time on her hands. Um, and what this actually means is there's a lot of paperwork. There are a lot of box-ticking exercises that end up taking place. Uh, the story I heard very recently is that if you're a childminder, you have to register a food diary with the Food Standards Agency and record every kind of food incident that comes up, like an out-of-date packet of ham in the fridge or something like that. Um, the other problem is, like, everything in the UK is planning. Um, so currently, Ofsted tells you that if you run a childminding service, you should probably do this in a home-like environment, so either your home or the child's home. And uh, local government says that you probably shouldn't run a business from your own home. So what this means is for renters, like most renters just cannot become childminders. Their landlord says they can't do it because their landlord says you cannot run a, bu a business from this property. The vast majority of people who would have usually become childminders, like young women who probably cannot afford to own their own homes. Um, but even if you own your own home, there are still restrictions. So there was, a, there was a new story from a young woman in Yorkshire called Holly Fitzsimons, who was running a childminding service from her mother's house. And she had six children, well, up to six children, who would come over throughout the day. But one of the neighbours was annoyed that they kept, that there were children playing in the garden, and also they kept using the side gate that was disrupting their house. So they complained to the local council, and the local, ah, oh, I'm not going to wave that. Um, They're aggressive, aren't they? Yeah, They're well, we did, we did say five minutes. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so the local council said, actually, no, you can't run this business. And um, they tried to shut her childminding business down. She appealed to the planning inspectorate. This took months and months. And eventually, the planning inspectorate said, yes, that she could do it. But they had, she had, they had to completely remodel the driveway, which cost thousands and thousands of pounds. And she had to close at 6 PM, which, in the news, this was presented as a victory. But it's, I think it's illustrative of how this gets so difficult. So hopefully, if we have all of these restrictions, surely we have like some of the like best educated like three-year-olds in the world. And the answer is no. <laughs> children who go through the early years foundation stage underperform children who are just at home in informal care. And this informal care might be like an illegal nursery that isn't offset registered. It might be um, it might be with a grandparent. It might it could, it could be lots of different things. So about half of children are in. Um, informal care. Um, my immediate question is maybe this is selection effects. Maybe children who are left at home have like some kind of advantage. But considering that I suspect that um, the children in childminding are probably disproportionately the children of mothers who work, I don't think the selection effects is Ample can explain it. I think it really is that the earliest curriculum is just not as good as being at home with an adult who likes you if you're a baby. <laughs> um, and the reason I think it's so difficult politically to defeat is that um, the idea that the early years foundation stage curriculum and the early years is very, is very good is such a powerful meme throughout our elite. Um, I think partly it's because there are a couple of P, like, papers from the US that I don't think are very good quality. I think they're basically p-hacked, where you look at like, a couple of different education interventions, and then you see, oh, well, this paper says that it's, it's not very good for white children, but it's good for black children. This one says, oh, it's good for boys. And this one says it's good for low-income mothers. And this one says it's good if you're you know, 
if, if your father's not around or something like that. So they all show different positive results. But people like use this to amass an evidence, a body of evidence saying that the early years curriculum really works. And then I think it really fits into lots of the sort of like mainstream elite opinion, which is that um, like meritocracy is kind of good and inequality is probably bad and genetic determinism is probably like not true. And therefore you have to come up with an excuse for why children sometimes underperform based on their parents' lives. Um, and early years is like a really nice story for how we can conquer this. So I think that's part of the reason it's so difficult. And then every time um, a politician suggests that they might do something to deregulate childcare, people get very upset because people hate the idea that we're endangering children. And it's very difficult to say and make the trade off that actually we can cut the food standard, um, the, food, the food diary, and maybe a child will occasionally like eat out of date food and get a bit more ill. And that is probably OK, because the trade off is that parents are impoverishing themselves by either quitting work or like <laughs> eking out most of their income. And that is much worse for the child than the current scenario. But as far as I can tell, it's impossible to make this argument in public discourse. So there we go. Thank you. Over to you, Matt. Um, thank you very much. By the way, to the guys at the back, I was told five to seven minutes. Is that okay? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no, they won't, they're not going to buy that. <laughs> um, and by the way, can I have the clicker? Because I think I've got one slide. Um, thanks, Nick. Okay. Um, that wasn't part of my five to seven minutes. Um, <laughs> uh, so these are the ten lessons I would try and teach a Prime Minister who asked me, uh, how do we escape stagnation through innovation? They're not going to ask me, but in case they did. Um, uh, first of all, the pessimists are usually wrong. Uh, when I was young in the 1970s, the adults said the future was bleak, uh, just as they say today. The population explosion was unstoppable, famine was inevitable, pollution was going to shorten uh, average lifespan. I don't remember any adult saying anything optimistic at all in the 1970s, full stop. Um, the outlook for man is painful, desperate, and the hope that can be held out for his future seemed to be very slim indeed. That was Robert Heilbronner, bestseller in 1970. Yet over the next half century, Average human lifespan improved globally at the rate of five hours per day. Extreme poverty went from over 50% of the world living on less than $2 a day in inflation corrected dollars to less than 8% today. Child mortality, the greatest measure of misery anybody can think of, fell by three quarters in that half century. So I am an optimist uh, about the world particularly I'm less optimistic at the moment about Britain, and here's why. Because, number two, civilizations are really good at stifling innovation. They did it in Rome, they did it in the Arab Empire, they did it in the Ming Empire, they did it in the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire, the Soviet Union. And they generally do it with some combination of bureaucracy and superstition. And we're doing that now. From GMOs to AI to nuclear to drones, we're letting pessimism fueled bureaucracy, superstition, and delay, we heard about that from Nick, uh, hold back and maybe even kill off innovation. Now, I'm not against all regulation, far from it. In fact, there's one uh, technology at the moment that I don't think we're regulating nearly hard enough, and that's putting furin cleavage sites into bat coronaviruses in Wuhan. Um, uh, at, you know, at the moment, I think we're panicking at mice and cuddling tigers. Uh, but uh, we're panicking at far too many mice. Lesson number three, we're a top-down country, but it's a bottom-up world. Most civil servants think in top-down ways, as if the world was a chess game. Deirdre made this point earlier, uh, and that they're moving the pieces. But it's not like that. From the English language to the internet, the world is full of things that, in the words of Adam Ferguson, are the result of human action, but not the execution of human design. As Anton and Deirdre both uh, made the point this morning, Politicians don't create prosperity, they create the circumstances under which ideas can have sex and produce baby ideas. Lesson number four, beware crony capitalism. Remember the projector that Gulliver met at the Grand Academy of Legado? Quotes, he had been eight years upon a project for extracting sunbeams out of cucumbers which were to be put in vials hermetically sealed and let out to warm the air in raw and clement summers. He told me he did not doubt, in eight years more, that he should be able to supply the governor's gardens with sunshine at a reasonable rate, but he complained that his stock was low. Um, if you subsidise an industry to make sunbeams out of cucumbers, sorry, hydrogen out of wind power, uh, <laughs> they will only tell you it cannot be done affordably after spending a billion of your pounds. 
The UK government championed airships, not airplanes, in the 1920s, and then it picked the wrong design of airship, the R101. And the trouble with picking winners, as uh, Dieter Helmer said, is that losers are good at picking governments. Uh, remember the cautionary tale of the compact fluorescent light bulb, a useless technology foisted on consumers at great expense by banning the competition, which greatly benefited the manufacturers and served only to delay the inevitable and voluntary introduction of a much more efficient and energy-saving technology, the LED. Uh, every businessman I talk to these days seems to speak as if his main customer is the government, not the, not the public. Lesson number five. Our political leaders don't get that innovation is not the same as invention. We touched on this point last night, or uh, Tyler did particularly. Inventing something is easy, making it affordable, reliable and available is much harder. Well, it's not easy, but it's easier to invent something than to make it affordable. Uh, great innovators from Edison to Bezos are not inventors. The linear model of science leading to tech, leading to innovation, is wrong. Uh, it goes both ways. Steam engines and vaccines were invented long before the science that explained them. Britain's always been invent better at the invention than the innovation. Lesson number six, am I keeping up with myself? Yes. Intellectual property does, does more harm than good. This is a controversial view. Uh, abundant evidence uh, exists that we have gone way too far in protecting IP through patents and copyrights. You get bursts of innovation when patents expire. Uh, you, there are all sorts of other evidence that these, are, the, these don't really incentivize innovation. The software industry does not rely on patents to incentivize people to innovate. And why the heck should the copyright on a book last for 70 years after the death of the author? I mean, my, what have my grandchildren to d d done to deserve any royalties from my books? Um, uh, um, they should get a job instead. Why, do, why did we pass that legislation? To please the Disney Corporation who was worried about losing the, the patent on the copyright on Mickey Mouse. Um, uh, lesson number seven, innovation is not predictable. If it were, it would have happened already. Uh, the mobile phone, the search engine, social media, they all took the expert prognosticators by surprise. There's no chance the iPhone is gonna get significant market share, no chance, said Steve Ballmer, the chief executive of Microsoft in 2007. Lesson number eight, Abundant, affordable, and reliable energy is a key driver of economic growth. Growth is a thermodynamic phenomenon. Innovation consists of making useful products out of chaos by putting energy into the system. The reason George Stevenson invented the railways was because cheap coal was lying about in big heaps in the northeast, and it was cheaper than hay for horses. Anton's right about London being the center of the Industrial Revolution, but where did London get its energy from? Newcastle, where I come from. It's very doubtful that a civilization based on expensive wind and solar power with its very marginal energy return on energy invested can be an innovative society. That's a controversial view, but it's one I will insist on. We need to go nuclear if we are going to be serious about the future. Uh, lesson number nine, it isn't true that innovation is speeding up. We touched on this last night. Uh, 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 Tyler did. Where are the flying cars, personal jetpacks, supersonic airliners, and routine space travel we were promised in the 1950s? Well, what happened was the first half of the 20th century was dominated by transport innovation, but hardly any innovation in communication and computing. The second half of the 20th century was the opposite. Hardly any innovation in transport. Okay, more cup holders in cars, but not much else than that. Uh, but huge changes in computers and communications. And that implies the next 50 years is not going to be about uh, the same technologies necessarily. Uh, I th I, I'm rather with uh, Tyler that uh, biotech is probably where the action is for the next 50 years. But you shouldn't believe me. Why? Because there are no experts on the future. Full stop. Anyone who tells you, using mathematical models, that they can predict the future performance of the economy, an epidemic, or the climate, beyond a very short time horizon, or without huge margins of error, is selling snake oil. The predictions that are useful are unreliable, and the ones that are unreliable are useless. Here's a quote. By 2005 or so, it will become clear that the Internet's impact on the economy will have been no greater than the fax machines. Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman in 1998. <laughs> Hands up those of you who lose a fax machine in the last year. 
Two. No <laughs> anyway, that's the end. Thank you. <laughs>Over to you, Sam. Thanks very much. Uh, so when I read the blurb for the session this morning, there was a couple of points that stood out. One was the use of the term blob, uh, and the other was the last line, the, the question that said, why haven't these ideas for reform happened already? And I'm going to try to answer that question in now four and a half minutes. So it's worth saying at the outset that, of course, there are many brilliant people, civil servants and on the political side, who are working hard in government to deliver growth. In fact, I think most of them are in this room. But <laughs> despite the best efforts of these absolute heroes, it is probably fair to say that we are not always an extraordinarily well-governed country. Um, some may say that my opinion of government dysfunction may be coloured by having worked in Boris Johnson's number 10. Who, who can say? Um, but clearly, our problems don't lie just with one prime minister. And I don't think that we have, for example, failed to deliver planning reform because we have a uniquely useless political class, although sometimes it does feel like it. And I also don't think that we have a civil service that are uniquely obstructive and uniquely determined to block progress. One thing that strikes me uh, is sometimes we talk to people about and people talk about how hard it is to get anything done in Britain, how impossible it is to build anything, how blindingly obvious reforms seem to get nowhere. There's almost this tone of the, of the supernatural to it, almost as if however hard we try, there is just this force stopping progress. And if we, we need to somehow sort of retrieve the shin bone of Adam Smith and bury it under Parliament Square for 30 <laughs> years and lift the curse. There's no curse, thankfully. There's no curse. The core issue and why reforms fail is that simply a lot of the time the incentives for officials and crucially the political incentives for the politicians who direct our officials don't, unlie, don't align with unlocking growth in the long term. But I do think we can change those incentives. So first, three thoughts on the civil service. As I say, it is absolutely not the case that all civil servants are determined to block progress. However, point one, there is usually a greater risk for a civil servant's career in strapping themselves to a radical reform that goes wrong than in stopping a radical reform from being undertaken in the first place. So the initial impulse when a minister comes up with a plan for great reform will be to throw as much sand on it as possible in the hope that their reforming zeal is extinguished. And of course, this impulse is particularly strong if the official deep down doesn't believe that their political master has the skill set, the resolve, or the political support to stick with the challenging reform for the long haul. Secondly, it is also the case, and this is particularly true of areas like planning, that there are, of course, officials, and this is potentially particularly true at a local government level, who have built their entire careers developing sector-specific knowledge and have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo rather than in ripping it up. And finally, there is an element of human inertia. It is, of course, much harder to produce the policy papers and draft the legislation and square off the sectoral interests than it is to not do any of that. So, as I say, there is also have this, this clear feedback loop between the effectiveness of officials and also the effectiveness of the politicians and their perceived power. Even with the various challenges that I've set out with uh, the civil service, a determined minister with clear priorities that they stick to and support from the centre and sufficient parliamentary support can deliver the radical reform that will deliver progress. Unfortunately, not enough ministers understand all the levers at their disposal, have the sufficient resolve to continue with, uh, with reforms, and this is in no small part by the work of organisations like Think Future, it's so important, getting truly brilliant people into public life. But as I say, it's not just an issue of core competence of ministers, but of incentives. Many more MPs agree with the need to reform planning than would be willing to vote for it. And this is often a rational position for them. NIMBYism is the strongest political force in Britain today. So either we need to hack it, as Sam was saying yesterday, through policies like street votes, or 
and this is harder work, and it's part of what we're trying to do with my campaign, Britain Remade, is you need to win over hearts and minds for growth-based policies. The real barrier to growth policy, the barrier, why these reforms haven't happened already, is not, in my view, elite interest. It's a lack of public support. So while it's hard work, we need to make the arguments in the country, and not in abstract terms about growth and GDP, but about people's lives, about cutting the cost of energy, about their weekly shop, about their mortgage. Reminding them, uh, we talked, Andy talked about narratives earlier, reminding them that in this country we built the world's first railway, the world's first coal-fired power station, the world's first commercial nuclear power plant, and we can build the future again. This was the richest country in the world. I don't know if we can do that again, but we can be a hell of a lot richer than we are now. Because it's amazing to be in this room stuffed with brilliant minds, but I think the path to growth lies with persuading the people outside this room. Thanks. Thank you, speakers, for your opening remarks. I'm going to ask each of you a question, and then I'm going to open it up to the floor. Um, so, Nicholas, I'll, I'll start with you. I mean, you, you made all of these arguments about what was different in the past and how all of these obstacles are now put in place, which make it much slower and much more difficult. Why haven't these things happened, as uh, what, what, what Sam was saying? What, what are the actual barriers that have prevented these things from being realised? So, I mean, ultimately, it's, it's politics, not process. Um, I think I probably should have said this in the, in the talk, actually. There's nasty people at the back distracting me. I, I don't mean that, guys. Um, um, uh, in a YouGov poll done about three years ago, 2% of the British public, 2%, that's not a typo, um, trusted developers to make their bit of the world better with a big development. And I think from memory, it was 6 maybe 7% of the public trusted the planning system. And this comes back to your point about the political power of NIMBY. So politicians can't fix that if the British assumption that a, a major new intervention in my bit of the country will make my life worse. So uh, uh, until that flips, I think, I mean, it, it may flip as, you know, the young generation are just being, you know, frozen out of the housing market. So it's possible the politics will change just through the sheer pent-up frustration of the young generation. I have to say, I don't think so, and it's not, not quite of itself, um, or perhaps not, or not as much as it should. Um, Simply because there are lots of people, and you know, I've met them, I've worked with some of them in community groups we work with, who are definitely being frozen out of the housing market, but are still very opposed to lots of things happening. So you can, the people seem to be able to hold that disconnect. So fundamentally, sorry to answer your question, yeah. um, fundamentally, um, the quality of what we produce, people's sense of ownership of the process that leads to it, I don't, we can't go back to sort of no planning or, or, or no public involvement, has to flip. And that is a generational change. That is not going to happen overnight. Um, but we, the British public need to relearn, not just to have confidence that new development will make them richer, that is part of it, but also they will make their lives better. They need to have confidence that it will be better. Because if you don't trust the developers, if you don't trust the planning system, all the promises, all the CGIs, all the thousands of pages of report that are needlessly produced, you don't believe. Mm. And until we get that belief back, which is, I think is a generational thing, it's very hard to change the politics. So, uh, a slightly depressing answer. So I am hopeful that can be done. And by the way, I've dedicated my life to doing that. Uh, and if you'd like to help, do please support Crate Street. Sorry. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Ari, I mean, you were kind of talking about childcare in early years. And that kind of made me think about this whole idea of safetyism. And there's nothing that um, people want to protect more than you know, children. And that can be a kind of an example that um, is easy to think about within, within that culture. I mean, do, do you think that something to do with safetyism and a broader culture of risk aversion might have something to do with the, the, the barrier to progress? So I don't know if I think it's necessarily risk aversion, because I think there are some places where we seem to be quite happy to have risks. Um, I guess I think maybe there's a difference between like immediate concerns and like concerns that are maybe like a couple of other degrees removed. Like one of the ways in which we weren't risk averse is we had like a pandemic plan that we literally never thought about. Um, if if we were like a very risk averse country, that would have been like one of the top things that we were like super serious about. Um, but yes, I, you're right that like lots of the near term things, it seems to be like oh you know we're making windows ugly so people don't fall out of them, even though as far as I can tell. I, I can't think of anyone who's ever fallen out of a window. Well, like, I can't, dead, know this. No, I'm thinking news stories and stuff. Quite, quite a lot of Russians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then they go off the roof, don't they, the Russians? Yeah, so I think we're, 
quite risk averse in like near term stuff, but not in terms of thinking about things that are like a couple of stages removed. Yeah. Um, so I think I can see why it's described as safetyism, but I don't think that's quite right. Yeah. Can, I, can I add a quick point on the? I don't want to yeah, do too it. much, but just so on the Windows one, it's really interesting. So as some of you oh. may know, um, there was a basically it sort of slipped through. Um, new building regs that came out last year basically ban sash windows, windows that are less than a metre from the ground, sorry, more than a metre from the ground, make, and will make, have a very material impact on what new houses look like. This wasn't politically willed, actually. As I understand it, there was one official working in the building regs department deep down in DLARC who, no doubt, genuinely thought this was the right thing to do, really committed to it, and it just sort of happened. And, and there are the thousands of these that happen that make our lives a little bit worse and make people more likely to you know, have less good new homes and propose new housing. So it's, it's, it's finding ways to sort of systematically take out all these little regulations that crack up and have an enormous collective impact. Sorry to talk too much. Actually, I, well, just, I think that is closer to a description of the problem rather than safetyism, which is that I think it's very easy to add an extra thing. I think it'd be really easy to run a campaign that said we have to include like equality and diversity. Um, window design. Like training. Yes, window design. <laughs> or like training in early years or something like that. Something for which there's like no evidence that it works. Um, and once it was there, I think it would be very difficult to argue to get rid of it. Um, and I think it's very easy to do this death by a thousand cuts. Well, it's just one thing. It's small. Don't you think that this, like, don't you think diversity matters? Don't you think food hygiene matters, et cetera, et cetera, until there are just too many things. Everyone agrees, basically, that we should do some kind of red tape challenge. And then no one agrees about any individual regulation that we should get rid of. And Matt, I mean, what, what role do you think regulation plays in all of this? Well, I think what, what happens is that you build vested interests in the regulations themselves. So, um, for example, uh, you know, the idea that you must put up a plastic barrier to stop newts getting run over by bulldozers on, on building sites um, somehow crept in. And why, and everyone knows that it's much more sensible to say, OK, you can develop houses here, but can you build a pond for newts next door? Uh, and you'll do far more good. You know, you, you, might, you might run over a few newts, but the newt population will do better, right? Uh, Tim Looney, uh, I think, uh, who's in the audience, was, was uh, trying to push that policy when he was in government. But the problem is, you've built an industry of newt consultants who are actually making quite a lot of money out of putting up these plastic fences around every building site. Mm. Um, and, and so there's enormous vested interest in these very barriers that Nick is talking about. And somehow we've got to balance that by creating vested interests <coughs> in development. Mm. And at the moment, if you're, a, if you're trying to develop a, a piece of farmland into residential property, uh, you spend a fortune on getting planning permission, not just on applying, but on lobbying and consulting and getting uh, surveys done and all that. Imagine if you spent that money on helping the local community. They would suddenly have a vested interest in your development. So it's, I think you've got to think of it in terms of competing vested interests and how you put them up against each other. And all that money that you spend before you've got planning permission is incredibly high risk, high cost of capital money. Because if you don't get planning permission, you've just burned that money. Yeah. So it's a huge barrier to entry. One of the reasons we're so dependent on a small number of house builders, who I don't criticise the building houses, by the opposite, is because it's only the big guys who can afford to make exactly. very deep equity funding, these big multi-million pound bets, to possibly build some houses 10 years in the future, which may take you another six years to build out. Mm. And Sam, you mentioned that we have to convince the public. Mm. So, I mean, is that then a failure of, of leadership then? Because presumably the people in positions of power, that, that's part of their job, making the arguments mm. and winning over the public in order to have the, the mandate and authority to drive through particular changes? The short answer, yes. But, uh, as I say, politicians are rational human beings who've responded to incentives over many years, uh, and partly they're the incentives that were created by the Town and Country Planning Act. But, um, Yes, I think shortly we have had a failure of political leadership and our politicians do need to make the case more boldly for the supply side reforms that we're going to need to get the economy going. Mm. Uh, so can I just it. ask Sam something? Um, in the 19th century, mm. uh, Cobden and Bright built a coalition inch by inch in favour of free trade, it, persuading ordinary working class people that uh, they weren't on the side of barriers against the French, mm. that essentially it's cheap, French. It, God, cheap French. <laughs> I just thought I'd get, got that in yeah. for you, um, uh, that the, the cheap imports were, on, were, were in their interest. It took decades to do, but as you say, it, 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 it changed 
the, the bottom half of society, not the top half. You know, that, mm. that, was, a, that was a political movement that came from below, not, not above. Mm. It was populist, if you like. Um, that shows it's possible, or was possible then. Why can't we do that today? Mm. I think that's what, exactly what we have to do, and I think the way to do it, as I set out in the remarks, says a range of things. You have to frame it uh, squarely in people's lives rather than in abstract terms. Frame it, you know, on the on the problems that they're facing now with their bills, with their mortgage payments, and how these reforms will actually practically impact them. Uh, and also talking about, uh, you know, framing it again in a in a patriotic context, and not to Sammy Hughes and I were talking about this yesterday that we are not changing uh, to be something different. We are changing to get back to ourselves, to get back to that Victorian spirit of industry and infrastructure. We are returning. Uh, to become more like ourselves through the reforms that we need to get growth going. I argue for cheap bread, not for free trade. Um, I think if I made that there is a challenge, and I'm conscious we, we, I'm sure you want to bring in the audience, but um, so when you make the case for, you know, and obviously I do, and we all do, I think, in this room, for, you know, for more housing, for obvious reasons, of, of cheaper homes, um, the problem is that the, the backlog of homes not built, and slightly depending on how you run your economics, it's somewhere between two and four million, is so immense... It is true to say, you know, adding another 10 homes there, 100 homes there, doesn't in itself change, you know, ch change those economics. And the problem is that very locally, when I've worked with lots of neighbour groups involved in you know, planning controvers controversies in London and other cities, if you bring in homes that make that little bit of London a bit better, which is a good thing to do, actually might, to use the language, gentrify that bit of London. And that might actually push up local prices. So you do get these quite odd and not unreasonable perverse incentives for people to oppose housing in their very local situation, yeah. if they're particularly in social housing and they're worried about affordability, they're worried about the nature of their tenure. So you, you, there are all sorts of ways of complex incentive that don't necessarily go in the big long-term interest, so they're quite rational short-term. Mm. Uh, yeah, so we're going to open up to the floor. I mean, we haven't really discussed uh, energy as much as we'd like in this panel, so it'd be very interesting if there's any questions on energy, because there's varying views um, in the audience on the panel about the role of net zero, so it'd be interesting to hear um, from questions around that. Uh, we'll take this guy at the front, so we'll take a few questions at a time. This guy at the front, uh, Pamela at the back. Uh, so I won't have a question about energy, despite being involved in uh, the pro-nuclear uh, work in Ireland. Uh, so uh, that was a bit last minute. I had one <laughs> written here. I have, I have another question. Um, my question is for the panel about um, the question of, like, to what extent do you believe that culture is upstream of these uh, questions of growth we're discussing here today? So um, to, to what extent like, do we need like, an optimistic pro-technology, pro-abundance, and ultimately pro-human, pro-human flourishing uh, culture as a prerequisite to growth, if at any. Um, uh, Mr. Ridley, you spoke a bit about pessimism and, and them ultimately always being wrong on that. Um, uh, Sam, you spoke about you know this median voter and, and catering to that group, which is I think kind of dovetails nicely with this. And obviously, the, this is mentioned in Tyler's book, in, in The Great Stagnation. He has the line, we should raise the social status of, uh, of scientists. And so I'd like to get to know to what extent you agree. And also, if you had a wave a magic wand, if you had a Manhattan Project for culture, what, what, what would you do? What interventions would you make? Great question. Pamela at the back. Thanks very much, Anaya. Uh, so Ari is completely right about the early years foundation stage, but it is uh, at least partly Nick and Matt's fault. So let me explain why. It's right. Nicholas, really sorry, sorry. Nicholas's fault <laughs> for perpetuating nostalgia for social reformers like Octavia Hill, and it is Matt's fault for perpetuating a narrative that we're top down, not bottom up. Let me explain the noughties and the Department for Children, Schools and Families. 1997, large amounts of money, unrestricted grants and service delivery contracts were given to Bernardo's NSPCC, Children's Society, Save the Children, some slightly uh, less um, lovely sounding ones, uh, the National Children's Bureau, National Children's Homes. Lovely Victorian woman in crinolines, maybe with trucks giving out bread to the poor. No, enormous behemoths with massive uh, press offices and public affairs departments. They then basically went into the Department for uh, Education Skills, as then was, with passes into the department, basically wrote the 2003 Green Paper, Every Child Matters, Every Child Matters, Sorry, this is a really uh, 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 sort of inside baseball um, information, but it is relevant. Um, the, uh, every, child, ch every Child Matters Green Paper had the five outcomes. Um, suddenly, teaching kids how to read and write went from being the sole responsibility, the, the sole um, priority of the Department of Education, to being one half of one fifth of five outcomes. Every child should be happy, healthy, safe, enjoying, achie and achieving 
everyone always forgets the fifth one, preparing for the future. That is what essentially became the Early Years Foundation stage, because once you have a set of people, really good, well-meaning people, but activists in a department writing policy from the bottom up, uh, you know, these are Burkean little, Burkean little, um, I, I, I'm being slightly facetious, Matt, but you see my point. These, they, they, were, they come from Octavia Hill yeah. and, and nostal nostalgism. And then, and then you get to the point where the department gets really renames the Department for Children's Schools and Families, total capture um, by, the, by the sector, to the point in 2008 to 2010 where we had people, um, you know, hard-working officials fighting in public service agreement and boards because one had to drive up the breastfeeding target through to start children's services, while the other, the, the other person yeah. had to um, get women back into the workplace, which they couldn't do if they were breastfeeding. Um, so uh, my, uh, the French, as I understand it, do not have the same wealth funded NGO infrastructure that we do in this country. Um, so my uh, plea, not really a question, is don't blame the bureaucrats. Blame um, the French. They're only, they're only, no, no, don't blame the French. Copy the French. Um, don't blame the bureaucrats. They're only obeying orders. It is actually the, the, the sort of British um, story of a really, um, you know, comes from a good place, uh, a bottom-up uh, way of doing policy making from, you know, okay. social reformers. Thanks, Pamela. We'll just take one more question. Um, this gentleman at the front, just at the front there, um, very quick, <laughs> then we'll go back to the floor and um, panel. Thank you. Uh, I want to pick up on the conversation about regulation. I work in VC, I work with policy startups on policy. Uh, we have backlog Britain when it comes to planning, when it comes to the NHS, but also with startups trying to get authorised going through regulators. This is often for very legitimate reasons. Um, if you're cultivating animal fat in a lab, uh, you can't get regulated at the moment for a whole load of reasons. And actually the regulators would quite like to be able to regulate you, but they don't have the resource, they don't have the funding. So we often talk about deregulation, but actually how do we make regulators actually work and fix them even when they want to support and be ambitious? Thank you. Um Okay, we'll go back to the panel. Uh, Nick, do you want to pick up first? Yeah, I'm sorry about being responsible for the, the woes of childcare. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll just quickly do the Manhattan Project for culture. I think there's one thing I'd change, there's something I didn't touch on, uh, would be this. I, I would uh, try, I'd like to wave a magic wand and allow Britain to fall back in love uh, with its northern post industrial urban towns, which in my experience are potential, in some cases are already, uh, vehicles for good purposeful, sustainable lives, well-lived, knowing your neighbours, being productive. We talked about Newcastle um, and in Haldane and I first met in, in Halifax. Um, some of you may have heard me tell this before. Um, one of Europe's most f beautiful buildings is the Peace Hall, which was built in the mid-18th century as a uh, wool exchange market. It's a building of almost surpassing beauty, built entirely for commercial purposes, like most of the great cathedrals and the great, actually we do know the name of the architect, the Great Pyramid, we don't know the name of the architect for certain. So that a building built entirely for commercial purposes by an unknown architect is one of the greatest buildings in Europe. If you don't know it, look it up. The Peace Hall, spelt like bits of cloth, not like the, the opposite of war. So I would wave the magic wand and allow the people who live in Surrey and Suffolk and Sussex, nothing wrong with that, to visit and aspire to live in and value the history and tradition and the future, not just of you know, Great Yarmouth and and, and Sunderland, but Halifax and Rochdale and, and all those places, because they are an amazing bit of heritage that I think we should reinvest in. I'll probably stop at that. Um, get two quick points. One, how do we get back to an optimistic culture? I'm not sure we ever had one. Um, if you look at the best-selling books of 1900, they're called things like The Decline of the West. I can't, well, that, that was a bit later, but, but there was an equally pessimistic one around that time. 1830. Um, Thomas Babington Macaulay, Lord Macaulay, writes a review of uh, Southey's pessimistic book about the uh, Industrial Revolution, which is just awful. You know, Southey is saying, this Industrial Revolution lark, it's not going to end well. It's a disaster. You know, we need to go back to bucolic England. And, and, and Macaulay writes, uh, why is it that with nothing but improvement behind us, we're to expect nothing but deterioration before us? Which is quite a nice remark, I think. Just very quickly on uh, the regulation point. Um, one way of thinking about it is what uh, 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 Chris Hodges at Oxford calls outcome-based collaborative regulation, where the regulator says, what's the outcome we want, which might include more innovation, more activity in the sector, um, rather than less, as it were, and how do you, the industry, and we, the regulator, collaborate to achieve that 
without too much regulatory capture. Easier said than done, but that's the right way to think about it, I think. Uh, Sam? Um, sorry, um, so just on the uh, uh, point of culture and growth and which is upstream of which, I think one thing that concerns me, and again, it's based on a conversation that I had yesterday, was um, that we've now had 15 years without growth and that almost some places have, or in, in much of the country, have kind of lost a sense of what it even is to be growing. Yeah. Uh, and I think that I think that breaking that cycle is incredibly hard. I think potentially a little bit of regional competition and regional tension uh, could help, and maybe that's where enterprise zones and these sort of things come in. Um, but even maybe, you know, this is where um, great schemes like the one by Octus Energy, who provide your neighbour with a brilliant wind turbine, uh, and it gives them 25% off their energy bills. That might make, might make people go, hey, I want some of that, I want some of that growing that growing uh, economy, that cheap energy. Would you, would you agree, Matt? Uh, definitely, uh, if it's cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Aria? So, I definitely think, obviously, like, culture will inform what kind of politics you have and what kind of incentives you have, and then incentives will inform what kind of culture that you have. <laughs> but whenever I think about countries that seem to be getting things right, the two that always spring to mind seem to be, like, Israel and Estonia. Like, those two are countries that just seem to be able to get things done. Um, regardless of sort of like how you feel about their politics or whatever. Um, I think some of it might be to do with the fact that I think those are both countries where they have a sense that their civilization is at war. Um, they've got people who do not like them on their borders, and I think it means that you have to be brilliant if you're in one of these countries. You have to have a state that runs well, otherwise you're going to be faced with annihilation. Um, I don't know how we can replicate that here, because like, I think we probably are, to some extent, faced with some kind French. of... French. The answer's the French. That's what the 18th century had. <laughs> Perpetual conflict with the French. It all comes back to the French. <laughs> um, the other group, that, and this is like just an opportunity for me to talk about one of my little obsessions that I think a lot about, is um, the Puritan settling of Massachusetts Bay, and how they also managed to create like a really fantastic culture. Like Some of it is that... like you get like the 80,000 people who are getting persecuted for their beliefs. You get like people who believe very strong things. But for generations and generations, you had such a weird proportion of like inventors and polymaths and abolitionists coming out of this community. Um, and clearly something was about how they fostered that culture. Um, I have no answer, I think, to how you can foster that again. Um, maybe because the incentives are wrong and all kinds of things like that. But I definitely think that if you understand how to hijack culture and if you can figure it out, then you could make a massive difference. Um, what Pavlina said, yes, I like, yeah, I agree like basically completely, um, which is complicated because obviously I also would like to be an activist who can go into a department and completely rewrite what they're doing, <laughs> but I would do it right. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone thinks that. Um, but like, the NSPCC, they did a very similar thing with, as far as I can tell, the online safety bill, which is currently like completely incoherent because they want to preserve free speech and also ban free speech. Um, and I don't think they've squared that circle, and part of that is because they've got activists with very different beliefs coming in to write it. Um, yeah, I'm not going to answer Andrew's question Sorry. about how to support regulators. Cause very, very quickly, Matt. Just a very quick <laughs> p p postscript to what I was going to say. Uh, uh, w if, if the culture was equally pessimistic in Macaulay's time, how come they didn't get purchase? How come it was possible to have an industrial revolution? And the answer is because the activists couldn't get political leverage on the system in those days to the way they, to the degree they can today, which I think comes back to Pamela's point. Okay, um, next round of questions. Uh, so we'll take three or four at a time. So this gentleman in the front and uh, Rachel in the middle um, over there. Thank you, uh, James Dixon. Um, I'm thinking about the culture question that the gentleman over there um, brought up, and it's uh, the idea of uh, you can potentially have a culture where you don't need growth. If you are uh, retired, you own your own home, all of the services that you need are sort of there. Now we're starting to get to the point where growth is not able to provide for that, as we see in public services, in the NHS, etc. How do we create that culture where you need to buy into growth? Maybe we're already getting there just through the way it's being forced, but how do you create that culture of needing growth for everybody and getting those incentives aligned? Uh, Rachel there, the manure at the front.
last couple of decades has been to grow our population quite far. And one read of public opinion is that uh, people didn't vote for that and didn't want it, and now don't love the fact that they have to build much more houses to accommodate it. Uh, do you think that that's a major factor when we're looking at um, housing development, including potentially what we do, you know, local housing for local people? Um, and uh, does it make you feel vaguely more sympathetic to you in the opposition? Very good question. Um, Manira at the front here. Thank you. Uh, my question sort of follows on from Rachel's, which is why is it that the public is sceptical about growth and some of these very sensible planning reforms? And I don't think it's because they're stupid. I don't think it's false consciousness. I think when it comes to development, they've had lots of experiences of big developers gaming the viability test. And uh, I'm very much in favour of planning reform. I think we should build more houses. But I do recognise why the British public think that the system is rigged against them and they're suspicious that political parties take money from big donors and so on. So is one way to change their scepticism uh, for politicians to show that when bad things happen, they, people do get punished? Uh, and I was thinking about how people on the left and increasingly the right have talked about the banking crisis and said, why did no banker go to jail? Uh, if you look at areas like uh, the, the, the regulation of the workforce and, and, and rights for workers, we have lots of uh, uh, businesses in the UK where uh, employment rights are not enforced and people are not being paid uh, uh, their wages. There is a regulator, but they don't enforce anything. Uh, so is uh, for capitalism to survive, for people to fall in love with business and, and private enterprise again, does the state need to be more demonstrably uh, uh, clear about when people are breaking the rules and trying to stop that on behalf of ordinary people? Mm. Well, we'll say this is a pro-capitalist, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I'll take is one it? more question. Uh, Jed at the back there. Um, a question around sort of Sam's points and critique of the civil service. Um, I think the three that you raised are very accurate. I'd add a fourth, which is um, it's increasingly an arm length body of the Labour Party. It's sort of soft left. It doesn't want to do things. It's got its own opinions. Is it time to sort of acknowledge that and maybe actually bring political appointee civil service to, to the forefront and be honest about it? Mm, interesting question. I say that as a civil servant, by the way. Like, I, hope, <laughs> I hope this is a safe space. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone want to uh, pick up on the things that we've said? Question about the civil service, immigration, the public aren't stupid. You know, there's, there's legitimate reasons why they've been concerned. Uh, Matt, do you want to start? Um, yeah, just on uh, Rachel's point, um, if you are, say, a Lib Dem politician, uh, making a limp, NIMBY case in your constituency but arguing for uh, complete free-for-all on immigration, then you are a hypocrite. You know, the, the, it's clear that the two are in conflict. You can't, you, you, you can't have it both ways on, on this. Um, uh, that doesn't mean, you know, I'm saying that uh, I, I know the answer to that, but I do think, I do think it's, that is an issue. And I, we've got David Goodhart in the room somewhere, and he was the first one to start pointing out that, that all sorts of degrees of social cohesion might be under threat from uh, mass immigration. So uh, you know, I do think that's a nettle that has to, has to be grasped. Um, how do you change that? Uh, you, you, Manira, you start bribing people, right? You start saying, OK, they're going to build houses that are going to block your views, but don't worry, here's £500 or £5,000 or something. Now, you don't do it quite that explicitly, but you build a new school or you blah, blah, blah. And, and what I think the public sees at the moment is that all the money that goes into getting planning permission, as I said, goes on consultants. It doesn't go into the local community to provide better services. There is a thing called a section 39, sorry, section, I can't remember what 106? it's called. 106? 106, thank you. Uh, section 106 where you, you know, money does, but, but they don't see that. They don't feel that. They don't know that. Your negotiation, if you're the developer, is with the council, not with, with local people. So uh, that has to be the way to sort of um, approach that issue. Sam? Um, so if you go back through them in reverse order, I think it, it probably is fair to say that the majority of civil servants, certainly those who work in Whitehall, are of a broadly 
Blairite persuasion, uh, and, and certainly the ones who work in the in arms length bodies as, as, as well. Um, but I, I come back to the core facts that ultimately, uh, despite that, the the sort of others that I've worked with have been very good at putting that to one side. And more than that, I think that um, it comes down to having faith in the politicians being able to stick with the reforms. Uh, and it is ultimately down to the politicians. Uh, and that's why we then need to, to feed in the sort of bottom-up approach uh, of giving them the political support in order to get the reforms over the line. I don't think there's sort of, you know, there's, there's need for a sort of a, a grand recognition of, a, of the kind of the soft left nature of the world. I don't, I don't think that's quite right. But um, on the other point, so to go, go back through, so Rachel, um, I mean, in every focus group that I've done, as part of the campaign, in every one, when you talk about house building, the first thing that people say is, oh, well, they're just going to go to immigrants. Uh, and particularly in lots of post-industrial northern towns that have seen recent large influxes of people who come over on small boats, they will say, well, that's just going to go to the large number of Afghans in the hotel over there. That's just going to go to uh, that large group of Albanian men. And I think it is a real um, misstep, of course, we should celebrate the fact that, as I think the Entrepreneurs Network, uh, I've got a report coming out, is it tomorrow or very soon, that shows that of our, <laughs> of our, of our, um, of our 100, what is it, what's the, what's the statistic of our, <laughs> the, the, of the, of, you know, we've got the embargo. <laughs> okay, no, no, no spoilers, but lots of great when startups. We did the report in 2019, it was a very high proportion of our highest growth startups um, are founded by immigrant entrepreneurs, and that's it, true basically across the world. Exactly that, exactly that. And of course, of course we should recognise that, but at the same time, for those who are pro-growth and those who are pro-house building, to only talk about supply and ignore the fact that we have added 1.1 million people to the UK population over the last two years, not, it's not only tone deaf, but it's ultimately totally self-defeating because you won't even get a hearing on the on the need to build homes if you don't talk about uh, the, the 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 impact on on demand as well. Um, and uh, Mira, I agree. Yeah, we should have strung up the bankers, and um, <laughs> and yeah, we should be doing the, the same. bubble French bankers. They're the ones. Yeah, most <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely right. The guillotine. Um, and uh, no, we should be doing the same for the for the major developers. Aria? Um, so I'll talk about the civil service first. It's clear that um, the civil service probably disagree with the government, but it's because, like, and I like, say this as a conservative, I think the conservatives have made like, a very strange choice by deciding to lose all of working age people in elections <laughs> and also lose London. So, like, Jeremy Corbyn would be prime minister if only people with jobs voted. Um, so it's, it's going to be very difficult for them to hire a civil service based in London that agrees with them. So, like, I don't know that hiring a like, political civil service is going to work on that basis. Um, it's just, it's just a big problem, that, and they like, probably need to figure out how to make a conservative case for people who aren't retired. Um, <laughs> um, what an idea. And then, no, I want to tie um, what James said with what Rachel said, which is that um, we obviously need immigration if we aren't going to have children as a nation. Um, if we, ca we can't basically have this like increasing ratio of like pensioners to um, to working age people and expect to still have like low taxes and good public services. And I would blame some of our problems on the fact that we do have um, like, quite quite a low birth rate and that like about half the population works full time. Um, so as a result, if we need immigration to function, um, then I think we do have to be able to work out how we can like, how we can make sure that people do not feel like they're losing out based on immigration. Part of it was just like racism and I don't know how to deal with the fact that people don't like, people who like look different and speak different languages. I think you can probably do some cherry picking of your immigrants to make them more popular. Most people like Australians and Americans and Canadians and people who basically speak English fluently, so Scandinavians and Indians as well. Um, and they don't like people who make their lives harder. And we haven't been very good at promising people the kinds of immigration that they want. Like post Brexit, we were meant to get like a points based immigration system and instead we got like 1% of the Albanian male population moving here. <laughs> like, 
I think people would be much more in favour of immigration if we could actually get them the immigrants that we told them that we want that they were going to get. And you can see this in the polling that people um, people say that they are not happy with the levels of immigration. They want less immigration. But if you ask them, they want more nurses, they want more waiters, they want more doctors, any profession. They're like, yes, I would like more of that. So we should probably be giving people more of that. And I think then they'd be happier. People are very happy with ideas like let's build homes for NHS workers. So that does seem like a solvable problem. Quick, quick question about that, Ari. I mean, some people would push back saying that actually our dependence on immigration means that we're not training people in our own country, so it disincentivizes businesses and so on to actually invest in, in, in training in our own country. Um, it probably does do that, but I think we are basically, because of the birth rate problem, I don't think that's a big feature of what's going on. Um, and that like British workers do seem to, you know, like half of us go to university. That seems like a roughly good ratio compared to other countries. Um, so it's not clear to me that the British public is like particularly low skilled and we're just supplementing it with like very, very well trained people from other countries. Mm. Um, so I understand kind of what you're saying in theory, but it doesn't seem to like match in practice what's going on. Okay. Nick, did you want to pick up on anything? Yeah, just a couple of quick things. Um, so I mean, we run lots of workshops with you know, neighboured groups in one way or another involved with you know, development. Sometimes they're opposing it and we're trying to help them stop opposing it. So I mean, we don't particularly encourage questions about immigration because it's sort of a bit outside what we can help on because if we're looking at a development in rural Devon, we don't really have talking about immigration in our solution space. But it does come up. I think it probably comes up more than it used to. It actually comes up in different ways. So you definitely get, I'm thinking one in Hertfordshire the other day, you definitely get you know, the comment you, you just made. You, you get a flip side of it as well if you're working in a high immigrant um, uh, community, or you know, perhaps more urban one, particularly in London, where actually it, it comes back to the G word, identification. So they're, they're worried it wouldn't, you know, the people who come and live here, it's not that they're worried they're going to be immigrants, they're worried they'll be gentrifiers, people who are not like us, people not from this bit of London. So, so I think it flips in different ways in different places and different communities, but it, it's definitely there. Um, um, to to, to Manira's uh, very important question um, about uh, you know, why we're skeptical for growth and how do we, how do we change it. Um, I probably said it too quickly at the, in my talk because I was being stressed by those nice gentlemen at the back again. Yeah. But um, <laughs> it, it really does come back to this key point about planning versus regulation. It is not unusual, it is normal to regulate the built environment. Civilization has always done it. The Romans regulated how you could build insular blocks. The Greeks did it. Uh, the earliest city that we've got evidence of its block pattern was clearly had some sort of guiding regulation about what you could put where. And uh, you know, if, uh, if Aaron and I live next to each other uh, in, a, in t houses in 12th century city of London, there was regulation stopping me put thatch on my roof because if it burnt down, it would have burnt down your house. You could have got at me through common law, but you'd really just rather I hadn't burnt your house down. So, so that, that's age old. But we got confused about 70 years ago and substituted, I think, very politically necessary regulation of the built environment for essentially top-down planning. So the, the, the way I've tried to phrase it, perhaps in a way to be nice to planners, is that let's bring the democracy forward rather than having a focus on the case-by-case, -case, complex, expensive um, development control process rather than having local plans which are much longer than most countries over a much bigger area and much weaker actually because they're policy documents not regulatory documents let's in a way that's politically acceptable locally let's pull some of that case by case arguing into just clear regulations and then this is the critical bit and the bit will be hardest to do but the government's i think moving making some good steps in the right direction as long as you follow those local regulations we can't yet do this in all places everywhere you have the right to build. You just, it is tick box. Tick box is often used as a, as a criticism. Tick box is perfect if you're building a house because you just need to tick the box. You don't have that high cost of capital. You just, as long as you build what's on the shelf, come back to those Swedish examples I showed a bit too quickly, you just know you can buy them because you can build them in this part of Sweden and that part of Sweden and that part of Sweden. So ultimately, we need to pull the democracy forward and do that. It's going to be hard to get there, but some things are happening. So there's a very important reform a few years ago, quite rightly, I think, sort of slipped through quite quietly, which was creating a new type E use class. Regulation or planning of use is the most sort of diabolical form of planning. Um, okay, you want to do some planning of use. You don't want to have a nuclear power plant, sorry, you know, in the middle of an urban centre. I don't think the politics would support it. Um, so, you know, really noisy, noxious activities you don't want to have in urban centres. Beyond that, not much. But now you can actually, there's much less requirement to get planning permission to change from a shop to an office, to a home. That's a really important thing. There are other uh, possibilities to think of local development orders, neighbour development orders, street votes. So I think that's the answer. 
but you've got to, I think, for the people to buy it, certainly at the moment, in the current political environment, they've got to feel that this is something that we, you know, we, we trust the outcome of this, um, rather than trying to uh, push it all into development control. And then just on the point about breaking the rules, yes, this does come up a fair bit, because um, the enforcement of planning and local uh, planning regulations is very poor at the moment. Again, you can, have, you can say we just need to chuck more money at it, but we're currently trying to run a Rolls-Royce system, and we'll never have the funding to run a Rolls-Royce system. Um, so I think here technology uh, and AI will actually help us to check more quickly whether what has been built is what, we, what was said would be built. But I, mean, I think ultimately it's about the process of planning moving into clearer building regs that will, will, will get us there, but it will be, it'll be a slow process. <coughs> Thank you. Um, we'll go for another round of questions. Uh, this lady at the front here, then the gentleman in the middle over there. Before I ask my question, I'd like to say one good thing about France, which is Same. that uh, the state pays 80% of all crèche costs from two and a half months to three years old. Between three and six, kids don't have to school, go to school, but if they do go to an école maternelle, that is also funded to about 80%. And I think uh, that is, is significant in the well-being of the families uh, and the work that they do. But what I did want to talk about was, was language. Uh, the last session was about rekindling uh, the economy, and there's been a lot of historical analysis about going back to golden days uh, based on empire, not based on empire. And while I think it's great to take pride in our heritage, I think British exceptionalism is a huge problem, and the language of exceptionalism is a huge problem, and it's a huge problem for people who haven't taken part in those great movements because they feel doubly left out. So there are things that can be said to encourage people like houses for NHS workers or, I don't know, the white heat of technology or peace in our time or the white people or whatever. There are better slogans that, that can be used. So one of the things I wanted to suggest was could we not look to sort of contemporary models for the future rather than constantly harking back? And one of the models that I think, sorry, it does come from Europe, um, is very, very useful is deliberative democracy. And the OECD did a report of about 250 local and regional uh, cases from Paris, Macron, uh, debating euthanasia to local housing issues, and there are fantastic reports. It does bring decision-making into the hands of local communities, and in some cases, it produces very surprising results of the kind that you're looking for. Uh, does anyone on the panel have experience of any of these? processes and why don't we do much of it in the UK? Thank you. Um, hands up as um, uh, the gentleman after him. So this, um, uh, when Arya said uh, that, you know, look at efficient examples and they're small like Estonia and Israel. And if you look at it, it's, uh, it's quite interesting that uh, uh, efficient countries tend to be small. And yes, there's one thing which is the sense of threat. But the other thing is that people know each other. And uh, for this second factor, if you think bigger countries, when they become efficient, and the line seems to be somewhere around 5 million people, they fall back on regionalization. So the Swiss, the cantons, know each other, get shit done, blah, blah, blah. And the interesting thing, so obviously the enigma is France, because how can a big country get shit done? And I said, asked this to them once, and they, they said back to me, why do you think we don't know each other? It's obviously a massive elitist system. Everybody has gone to it now. So they don't know each other. So Britain almost has the problem, I would say, that it is too big, doesn't have the regionalization, so people don't know each other. So Britain, what it's doing now, and I'm going to say this as a German who lives here for many years, what Britain is doing is uh, with these, uh, and Andy Holding spoke about this, these metro mayors. But again, it's completely voluntary, and it creates a big mess. Because, to be honest, I live in Somerset, and around Yeovil, if you want to invest, you have no idea who's in charge. Is it the MP, the LEP, the devolved authority, the mayorality? And the, the question is, is this just how Britain works? Uh, it has to be by consensus, and let's see who wants it or not at the cost of complexity? Why can it just not be implemented? I mean, there is the region, there is seven regions, there are roughly five million people. Just get it done. So my question is, just, is that just anti-culturally not possible? Because it's so obvious that that is one key factor, unless you have the sense of threat, which would require a war with the French, hopefully, this time. Um, <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and, uh, but, <laughs> and uh, yeah, anyways. I think I've done well. <laughs> so this is our last round of questions. So we're just going to take a few more points. Please keep it really short and sharp. So the gentleman over there, um, the young lady over there. Um, 
Oh, I wrote a question. I've lost it. Oh, there we go. Um, so a theme, a theme that came up was the level of involvement from consultants, lawyers, NGOs, regulators in economic decision making and this sort of bloat of the regulatory ecosystem. And my question is, is this not partly a result of the government taking a deliberate step back from um, taking a strategic role in the economy? You know, we've had um, outsourcing and privatization of expertise, decision making, the hollowing out of state capacity. And we can certainly see the way it's impacted energy and transport and goes part of the way to explaining why we have such high prices for building nuclear or high speed rail, um, but also arguably has an important role to play in the housing um, innovation industrial policy as well. Thank you. And just uh, that lady over there. Hi, I'm Phoebe Oslin Nuggage Wakefield from uh, Boom, the campaign to reignite the baby boom. I have a question for Aria and Matt. Aria, you said it's impossible to deregulate early as childcare to make that argument. Is there a group that's well placed to make and win that, that case? And that makes me think about Matt's vested interests. You know, what vested interests can we deploy here? Mm -hmm. And just one final question before we uh, go back to the panel. Uh, Good Thomas. Cheers. Hi. Um, my question is about, well, it's for Sam actually, about um, dispelling uh, old school economic narratives. So um, Stoke has this reputation for being the home of ceramics and, and, and the potteries, but its biggest employer is Bet365. And I'm not saying the way out of the great stagnation is, is online gambling, but the, I think there's something to be um, said for trying to kind of reconstruct a narrative, which isn't actually going back to the Victorian days, but is thinking, these tech transformations are taking place already in these cities, in these towns, across the country. So I'm wondering, some, from the work that you do, sort of, you know, how you see those narratives playing out, and I guess what role there is you know, politically moving forward to try and sort of, I guess, create that positive uh, future for these places. David, good heart. Did you have your hand up? Because I know that you were mentioned earlier. Do you want to, did you want to quickly make a point? Um, I, I took your name in vain, David. Yeah. <laughs> And having mentioned my name, I felt I ought to say something. And, and I'm sort of reinforcing what uh, Rachel and Manira were saying about, well, kind of implicitly about the divergence between growth, GDP growth, and, and well being. I mean, probably a majority, I mean, I can't remember the last time I looked at the polls, but something like 50 or 60% of people in Britain say that society is changing too fast and it makes them feel uncomfortable. So if they associate growth, with change, they're not going to be in favour of it on the whole. Mm. Uh, immigration has already been mentioned, but I think the family too is absolutely crucial here. I mean, if you, you know, um, it's not just, you know, you associate growth with high immigration, you also associate it with huge stress on the family, the double shift, particularly for women. Um, you know, if you, um, you go back to the 1950s, and of course, no one is suggesting we should go back to the 1950s. But you know, you had uh, you had a breadwinner and you had a homemaker. You had one contributor to, to GDP. You now have the equivalent family will now have three contributors to GDP: the the double breadwinner family and the person who's looking after the kids. Um, and that is progress in some ways, but it's also a kind of artificial increase to GDP, which is not seeing a corresponding increase to well-being. Um, and just a, a brief addendum, um, as Diane is in the room, Diane wrote an amazing book about GDP, which is terrifying, <clears throat> absolutely terrifying in parts. The very, very fine judgments, which distinguishes between a financial sector which is five or 6% of the economy and one that is nine or 10% of the economy. We just kind of don't, not, not only is there this divergence between well-being and, and GDP, but we don't even really know what GDP is properly counting. Obviously, it's massively undercounting the, all of the activity that goes on in the family and in informal care and so on. And we, and we kind of need to factor that into this whole debate about growth, I think. Thank you, David. Okay, just one minute <laughs> each. Uh, panelists very, very quickly. Um, Sam, do you want to go first? Okay, so just very quickly with this gentleman's comment here, it is possible to construct a narrative that is both nostalgic and patriotic and also modern and forward-looking that looks to the future of the British economy, a service economy, but also recognises that we need to build stuff. New homes, new transport links, new sources of energy. And to this gentleman over here, the main barrier to that at the moment are our planning regulations and the onerous environmental impact assessments. It takes 13 years 
to get a new offshore wind farm up and running when building the thing takes just two. The reason for that are the environmental impact assessments and the time it takes to get a grid connection. Very quickly, to this lady's comment here who spoke uh, about the need for a narrative that moves beyond British exceptionalism, can I just very, be very cheeky and ask everyone in the room who is British to put their hands up? Everyone who is proud to be British, keep your hand up. Well, I think that every coherent narrative on growth runs through pride in this country. This is the greatest country in the world, but we've got a small issue. With <laughs> the French. <laughs> with the French. <laughs> and, with our, the and, with, and, and with the Australians and with our sustainable economy. But we can once again be a wealthy nation. Right. Okay, thank you. Matt. <laughs> um, can, can I link two questions together? The one about centralisation versus uh, uh, federalism, as it were, and the one about the, the quangos. I think they're the same issue. I think what this government, what this country has done over the last 50 or 60 years is take power massively to the centre, away from mayors and regions and councils and counties and all that kind of thing, and then redistribute it, not geographically, but sectorally, to powerful quangos. And I think that's a disaster, and I think that would be a good one to reverse. Thank you. Aria? Um, so I want to come back to what you said about French childcare. I think um, if we spent the exact same amount that the French government did on childcare, we would still have incredibly expensive childcare because theirs is just, it's just worse. Their childcare is worse, and that's a good thing. Is basically what I'm trying to say. They have like, they have way more children per adult. They do not have such a rig rigorous curriculum, and it's cheap to run. And I think that's fantastic. Um, on with Phoebe, what Phoebe said, yeah, I think we do need someone to basically really criticise the early years um, uh, meme, and maybe that is what Boom should do. So please, um, and then quickly on what David said, um, I think for what you said to be true, I think you have to believe that um, basically that specialisation of labour doesn't make sense when it comes to childcare, and or and or that like basically all women are like basically specialised for childcare if, you're not, if you think that the um, two-income household is not an advance. I think there are probably lots of people who are very well suited to be professional child carers and lots of people who make fantastic parents who, do not, who are not best placed to like, withdraw themselves from the economy. Um, and so I do think that people working and paying child, child minders is, like, is a very good thing. Nicholas. One minute, very test. Very appropriately, the people at the back are waving those signs again. Um, <laughs> I'll be very quick. Um, well, quite quick. Um, uh, just on the deliberative democracy, um, I mean, I, so yeah, we, we, we create streets run lots of what we pompously call charrettes, which is a sort of deliberative process to get support for, for local development. Obviously, when I won, run them, they're brilliant and very fair-minded and, and perfect. However, they are very, very capable of being manipulated, and I have seen them manipulated time after time. Um, so I think our sort of mantra is when you're trying to involve the people in supporting local homes and development is engage engage deep I run those do that because actually you can get people to agree most people are actually reasonable and they can make trade-offs between themselves but also engage wide and again here I think technology is, is transforming the situation I mean literally over the last few months a few years we, we run an online platform we ask very simple questions what's your favorite place in this area which, which is the place you least like which would you most like to see improved we get remarkable and statistically significant significant uh, you know uh, agreement on that and we then use that to, to, to build a coalition for, for, for reform and AI is then transforming that even further um, so point one on that point point two just on on um, local government uh, I, mean, I spent part of the first part of my career uh, actually doing lots of organisational reform in the private sector. I have to say, I came to the view that it was nearly always a complete waste of time and that the amount of disruption you created and people jockeying for jobs certainly sort of caused enormous amount of, uh, of anguish en route. That said, we do have a systemic problem with the way most of our uh, local government is run and building houses. So when we have a non-unitary system, uh, when you've got district councils and county councils, typically, well, always, county councils have highways and district authorities have planning. And th those two can, and often do, in my personal experience, you know, contradict, disagree, this, that, and the other. So that creates a definite uh, uh, potential. I do get nervous, and this is perhaps going on my area of expertise, but I do get nervous when you pull apart areas of local government and sense of local identity, which I think really matters. So if I could wave a magic wand, which I, I don't think I can on this, I would have 
many of what's now at the district or the unitary authority at the county level, and I would align those counties to the historic counties of England, Scotland and Wales, and then I'd push a lot more power down to the parishes, and I think, rather, dare I say it like the French, I would then have a powerful mayor in each parish. And they, I'd say, set some bits of policy, and the rest could put, goes up. That's what I would okay. personally do. I don't think that's about to happen. No, no one, one more thing. Oh. I, I wanted to bring <laughs> the French very, very quickly. Just on Stoke. So, interesting, I spent a lot of time, or some time, uh, going to the equivalent in France of Stoke on Trent, which is Limoges, which has also got a great history of, um, of, of pottery. Um, they've also kept that going. It's, it's now an elite high end thing. Um, Limoges is a much nicer place to go to than Stoke. I was in Stoke on Tuesday. Um, they've sorted out their, 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 their huge, great one way system going through the town of Stoke hasn't. And it is a place you would actively seek to go, not just to buy lovely, high, high end pottery, but to relax, have a meal, All have right. a lovely time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, don't leave your seats just yet. We have an announcement, but firstly, let's have a round of applause for our fantastic. <laughs>